church. Good to be together today. For those of you who are with us virtually, it is grateful. We are grateful that you're in our midst. And for those of you here in person, it's good to be able to see you this morning. I want to encourage you to do one thing as we get ready for worship. Get your Bibles and find Luke chapter 8. We're going to be spending some time in a little bit on it. Luke chapter 8. Our call to worship comes from the psalmist. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Sisters and brothers, let us worship our God. before us, we know that our God is approachable, that our God is a God of resurrection and hope and peace. So in that knowledge, let us confess our sins one to another and to our faithful God. God of compassion, have mercy upon us as we confess our sin. In Christ you bring light, yet we still dwell in darkness. Your word offers guidance but we choose to ignore your counsel. You promise renewal, but we heed not your wisdom. We bow to the gods of this world, choosing to hide from your truth. Speak to us again from beyond the clouds of our sinfulness. Dazzle us anew with the light of Christ's love. Restore and forgive us. Jesus, through the mercy of our Lord and Savior, 
our Father in heaven. It is through Jesus Christ that our sins are forgiven. Sunday morning. It's so wonderful to see all of your faces, and it's awesome to be on your devices, you that are watching at home and throughout the week. It is a blessing to share the Lord's love and spirit with one another. I have just a few announcements. I want to remind you about the connection card that's attached to your bulletin. Be sure to fill that out. If you have a prayer concern or praise, um, put it on the back of the card so that we can pray for it. If you check confidential, only our pastors will see those. Otherwise, our elders, deacons, and prayer ministers will pray over those uh, in the next 48 hours. Also, um, online, if you uh, see the button above the live feed that says connection card, click on that and fill out your connection card as well. We want to acknowledge your presence with us. We've got a great week ahead of us here at FPC. Our Vacation Bible School starts tonight, so don't forget, come back 515 for an awesome dinner. And then our adult class starts at 6 right here in the sanctuary. And our kids have a great lineup of crafts and games and lessons. It's going to be a fantastic night. night well, tonight, Monday and Tuesday, fantastic three nights of Vacation Bible School here at FPC. So please come and join us. If you haven't signed up, just come on. We will make sure you have a plate, and we'll make sure you have a space um, to dive deeper into God's Word and enjoy fellowship together. Also want to acknowledge the uh, insert that's in your bulletin today for the Urban Renewal Center uh, presenting Freedom Songs. And so we will have Dr. Anthony Olds here again. He did a concert a couple of months ago and blew our socks off. You don't want to miss this. He plays the organ like no other. And so we hope that you will come and be a part of that and sing along with him, um, as, along with our choir and many other talented folks. We hope that you'll come and um, and enjoy. It is next Sunday at 6 p.m. right here in the sanctuary. And then on the back of the insert, just a reminder that school is coming at some point. And we want to make sure that the elementary school kids at Jaycox have new uniforms to start the new school year. So that, um, that fundraiser will start next Sunday. So uh, be sure to keep your eye out for that. At this point, I'd love for you to stand and greet one another and pass the peace of Christ. Thank you. 
can buy on school to happen, but even if it rains, we're going to have a fun time indoors. If you haven't signed up, you can still sign up. We're going to have the best time ever. We're going to have a free dinner. The kids are going to have a good time. The grown-ups are going to have a good time. And if you're so well-mannered, at the end of the night, Jack, the ice cream truck will come. But only if you're really well-behaved during the children's sermon also. Yes. All right, so how many of you are, are, have ever had something that they're really scared of? Raise your hand and tell me if there's something you're really scared of. My golden retriever. You are not scared of a golden retriever. Nobody can be scared of a golden retriever. Are you really? What are you scared of? I'm scared of tarantulas. Yeah, I'm scared of tarantulas too. Alan, are you scared of anything? Well, I think the darkness mainly. That's a good idea. That's a good thing to be scared of. A lot of people are scared of dark darkness. London, what are you scared of? Here, lean it. And bees and like wasps. Bees and wasps, that's a good thing to be scared of too. Those are scary things. You know what I'm scared of? I'm scared to death. Now don't tell anybody this. I am scared to death of going down an escalator. I am so scared to go down an escalator. I will not I will not go down an escalator. I will lose everybody that I'm traveling with to find stairs. Yes. There's so many people that can hear me. I know, I know, I know. It's not the worst thing they've heard about me, did it? Um, I'm scared to death of going down the escalator. I will not go down an escalator. And Jim today is going to talk about a story in the Bible where um, Jesus was with his disciples and they got into a boat, right? And, and what do you think? You were telling us a story about Job. Do you know this story in the Bible? What happens, what happens when Jesus and all his disciples get into a boat? Oh, they make a ladder. What cause? A big a big storm. A big storm. And do you think Jesus is so scared? No. Because no, Jesus isn't scared of anything. But do you think the disciples were scared? Yes. Yes, they were scared to death. And they woke up Jesus and they said, help us, help us. And he said, ye have little faith. And he calmed the storm. And everything was great, right? So that made me start thinking that Jesus can help take care of our fears, right? Because nothing's too big for Jesus. And he's not scared of anything. And he can help us when we're afraid. So I'm going to close this in prayer, and we're going to go learn more about this um, in Children's Church. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, Lord, and thank you for the privilege that we have to be here today, Lord. And thank you that we know no matter what we're scared of, there is nothing too scary and nothing too big for you, Lord. And you, if we have enough faith, you can be with us and help us through all things that are scary to us. In your heavenly name, amen. amen. All right, let's go. Okay, while the kids are going out, Bibles, Luke chapter 8, Luke chapter 8. Um, I want to start by giving you a, a little bit of a, a primer on Luke itself, and I think it'll be really helpful for us this morning. So you remember that Luke is written to a non-Jewish audience, primarily a non-Jewish audience, what we would call a Gentile or a Greek audience. Though, at the time, it's really the Roman Empire, what we call the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. We'll talk about that in, in a moment. So he's writing, and he's, he is trying to find a way to explain to an outsider um, who Jesus is in the context of not only Judaism, but just who Jesus is. And as he's doing that, he's doing some interesting things. So you'll notice, just in Luke, for example, you go back and look at it, there's a genealogy of Jesus. In Luke, it goes all the way back to Adam. Um, that's an attempt of Luke to be able to say that even in the Hebrew story, um, Jesus goes back to the very first man. You'll notice that after Jesus is baptized and he goes through the testing in the wilderness, he comes and he preaches and he is rejected by his people because he includes others in the gospel story, in, in the story of faith. You'll notice, we talked about it last week, for example, that the centurion is the one who Jesus says, I've never seen such faith as great. The centurion is a Roman, not a Jew. And then when you get to the story today, I, you're going to see some things that I think are overwhelmingly really, really, really interesting. But we have to kind of pick it into its context. So let's look at Luke chapter 8. I'm going to look at verse 19. And there are two stories here, two brief stories. And you're going to wonder, why in the world would they be put together? 
But if you look at all of Luke uh, chapter 8, let's say start at verse 18 and you've got your Bibles, just look and see what it says. It says Jesus' mother and brothers. Then it says Jesus calms the storm. Jesus restores a demon-possessed man. Jesus raises a dead girl and heals a sick woman. I'm going to show you something really interesting that connects those stories. So, Luke chapter 8, beginning with verse 19. Now Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him, but they were not able to get near him because of the crowd. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to see you. He replied, my mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. One day Jesus said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke him saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. He got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided and all was calm. Where is your faith, he asked his disciples. In fear and amazement, they asked one another, Who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. That's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, question of the day. How many of you have ever eaten a peach? We may have the first time in the history of First Presbyterian unanimity on something. So, Matt, let me ask you. Let me ask it again. How many of you have ever eaten a real peach? Okay. Let me let me explain the right answer before you think you're going to answer. So, this is not a peach, by the way. This is a pseudo peach. A real peach comes from South Carolina. They can call Georgia the Peach State all they want to. A real peach cannot be, and this is absolutely gospel, South Carolina gospel truth, a real peach cannot be eaten before the 4th of July. Absolutely not. Only Yankees would eat peaches before the 4th of July in South Carolina. Uh, if you are from the Sand Hills of South Carolina, you would have populated the Gilbert Peach Festival over the 4th of July weekend and learned all of these things. A real peach, this is, this is like a pseudo peach because it's, it's got no fuzz on it. A real peach is fuzzy. Now the reason it's fuzzy is that the peach wants you to not only taste it, but the peach wants you to feel it while you're eating. A real peach has this sense of just this beautiful movement within. Just as you, as you start to touch it, it doesn't womp and clump. But here's the real test. A real peach cannot be eaten with a napkin. A real peach can only be eaten with an entire roll of paper towels. Because a real peach starts and it is impossible to eat it without it running down your chin and onto your shirt. That's the definition. Now, how many of you have eaten a real peach? Okay. Now, here's the thing. This is what Luke is doing. Luke is trying to offer us a taste of the real Jesus, not a pseudo-bite. Because the danger, and this is the danger of our faith, right? You start to think about Jesus, and you have the real Jesus, but then you can get these pseudo-interpretations, or just sort of jesus light. And over time, you start to accept this. You know, you can go into the grocery store 365 days a, week, a, a, a year and buy one of these. It's, it, it's easy to, to take the substitute or the pseudo. And so what Luke wants to do is Luke wants to give us, as he's writing to this, to this new audience, this, this audience really of, of, of the Roman Empire, he wants to give them a taste of the real Jesus. And he develops these ongoing conversations of faith, which I've mentioned even now, but, but as we look at it in particular in this eighth chapter. And here's Luke's issue. Luke doesn't want to say, do you have faith? That's irrelevant to him. Luke wants to say this, what do you have faith in? Luke would say, and I'm interpreting Luke, this is Jim's understanding. Luke would say that everyone has faith. Everyone has faith. Everyone believes in something. Everyone has something in which they trust or which they have some belief or which they have some confidence. That's not the question. But he says, what do you have faith in? Now for the Roman Empire, for, for the people, that, to his audience, 
The, they would have faith if they had it, when they, when they do have it, they would have faith, for example, in, in the Caesar, because that's his image on the coin. They would have faith in the, in the Roman army. This is the time called the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. And, and, for, and in many people can say, historically, it was one of the seasons when the Romans were in control that there was the greatest peace in that region of the world. The peace was there at the tip of a spear. The peace was there by brutality and by intimidation, but it still was there. They might find confidence in, in the military. They might find confidence in, in law and in legislation, even with the Caesar that took place. They might have faith in, in these institutions and, 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 and in these things. But what Luke wants to say is that we, the followers of Jesus, have faith in Jesus. A relational faith. For Luke, faith is relational. It's not about, oh, I trust this, I believe in this, I have confidence in this. But it's, in whom do you believe? Right? As we begin the Apostles' Creed later, you'll hear me say that. Christian, in whom do you believe? And so when we get to the story about, about the boat, it's really interesting to me. Jesus fell asleep. They're going to the other side, by the way, because the other side is non-Jewish people. And, and, and he falls asleep. A squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger. Now Luke tells it this way intentionally. He doesn't say they felt like they were in danger. It doesn't say they were afraid of the, because they, 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 they just they didn't trust. He said they were in great danger. And the disciples went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. He got up, rebuked the wind and the raging waters, the storm subsided, and all was calm. And Jesus says, where is your faith? Now keep in mind, he doesn't say, why don't you believe? He doesn't say, why do you have little faith? He simply says, in this context in Luke, where is your faith? And it's interesting how they, how they answer. They don't get it, but they get it. In fear and amazement, they ask one another, who is this? When Jesus asks, where is your faith, they start answering, even in the 8th chapter of Luke, without fully understanding it, who? The faith is in Jesus. Jesus is not only first and enough, as we talked with the centurion last week, but now Jesus is first and enough, and the key of life, the key of faith, is to stay close to him. Now here's what gets really, really cool. So the story, his mother and brothers come, Jesus says, who is my mother and my brothers? But those who do, who hear the word of God and seek to live it out. Now, that story is a story then of inclusion, of drawing in the non, it doesn't, you don't have to be an ethnic Jew, you don't have to have the DNA of Jesus to be his brother, to be his mother. But immediately it goes to the storm. Let's look at the stories after that. The garrison demoniac, they get to the other side. This man is demon-possessed. What does he do? He falls at the feet of Jesus, and Jesus heals him. Jairus. Jairus is a leader of the synagogue. His daughter, his 12-year-old daughter, is deathly ill. He comes, and what does he do? He falls at the feet of Jesus. On the way to Jairus' daughter, this woman comes up with a 12-year bleed, and the crowd is pressing in, and she gets down on the ground and she grabs on to the, to, the, to the hem of his garment in order to be healed. And then when Jesus gets finally to Jairus' house, Jairus' daughter has died. And what does Jesus do? Jesus goes in and takes her by the hand and says to Lita Kum, come, get up, little girl. And she's raised from the dead. In every one of those stories, you see the commonality? There's a touch. There's, there's, there's a closeness to Jesus. It's at, it's at the feet of Jesus. The Gerasene demoniac, it's Jairus at the feet of Jesus. It's the woman at the feet of Jesus. And in this story, it gets even, I think, more amazing. Because now it's not simply at the feet of Jesus, but they go because they're in great danger and they wake him. And I don't think they wake him by saying, Jesus, Jesus, there's just something. No, I think they grab him and they yank him and they pull on him to wake him up. And the whole point of this is that the story of faith for Luke is to get close to Jesus and to stay close. And then we can infer that the enemy of faith is to stay alone. 
is, is, to, is to stay away. So I mentioned last week uh, about playing softball in a church league in South Carolina. <clears throat> um, and this, was, this, this season was one of the greatest seasons of my life, playing softball. But, but here's why. Because it wasn't really a church league. It was a church and prison league. And we would go to the we would go to the to the penitentiary, and uh, there would be half prison teams and half church teams. And it was a big league, and they had the prison had its own uh, you know uh, you know field, and we we'd play softball. And so about half the time, sometimes more, a church team was playing a prison team. And, and the thing that was intriguing about me was that was that the, the the prison teams never ever ever won a game. They never won a game. The Baptists always won everything, but I mean, but, but they, never, they never won a game. Here's why. Because every prisoner that got up at bat, he might hit a line drive, he might hit a little blooper out into the outfield. He would run and barely, the, it, would, it would be, to, if you could get to first base and get a single, that would be great. But every single prisoner, when they got to first base, they turned the corner and they tried to make a triple. Every single time. And they lost to the church over and over and over. It's taken me years, I think, to figure this out. Here's the reason why, I think. Every hit had to be a triple. Because they were not playing against a church team. They were playing against each other. They were playing against the culture and an environment of being in prison when you had to stand out, you had to show that you weren't afraid, you had to show that you were bold, you had to show that you weren't going to stop, you had to show that you weren't timid, you had to show that you weren't going to accept the single, you were always going to go for a triple. They were competing against each other. And it caused them to lose, in my experience, almost every single game they played. And let me simply say this, you and I, we can easily reside in the same prison where every hit has to be a triple, where we have to stand out, we have to go further than the next inmate. This is embedded into the American culture. We have what we call, even in fields of study, in leadership studies, there's an entire field called the great man theory of leadership. It's based on the idea that <clears throat> that there are great men and women, I suppose. The theory came when we weren't talking in that way, but there's the idea, the sense that there are these great people that rise up. We think about World War II and we think about where would we be if it weren't for, for, for MacArthur, if it weren't for Patton, if it weren't for, for Bradley, if it weren't for Eisenhower. We think about our own culture and, 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 and go back even further and we think about the, 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 the great man theory of George Washington or Thomas Jefferson or Abraham Lincoln or more recently, Martin Luther King or JFK or whatever it may be. You know, I mentioned to you a couple of weeks ago that when Cheryl and I were in Eastern Europe and we were talking with Ukrainian refugees and we talked with hundreds, you know, not a single one of them ever mentioned President Zelensky, ever. And they never came up. We look at it and we think, wow, what an incredible leader he is. I mean, wow, what an amazing, but for them, they don't see, their culture isn't embedded in this great leadership, this great man or woman leadership. It's embedded more in, look at what we as a people, as a nation, are doing. Now it's wonderful to be able to celebrate this, right? I mean, there are great men, there are great women. But if we're not careful, it becomes the, almost the sole interpreter of life. You have to stand out. Every hit has to be a triple. You've got to make it. You've got, to, you, you've, got, you've, got to, you've, you've got to be the one that's noticed. We see it even in the church culture. We see it when we raise up saints like Mother Teresa. Yes, an amazing person, but she's so great we can't be like her. Or even in the Protestant sort of saint world as we lift up Billy Graham. So great, but we can't perhaps be like him. This, this idea that God calls up just these, this is not, this is not what Luke is saying. What Luke is saying is that, is, is that he wants us to taste the real Jesus, which calls us to get close, causes us to, you see, there's a risk. There's a risk in eating a real peach. It runs down your chin and onto your shirt. It's a risk to get close. It's a risk to get close to Jesus. 
Because when we get close to Jesus, he strips you of you. He strips you of the triples in life. He strips you, he strips us, he strips me of, of, of our understanding of our, of our own, even our own potentiality, of our own, of our own how, we, our single, how we single ourselves out and we seek to live this sort of triple life. There's a risk because, because to, to, to fall at the feet of Jesus, to, to grab hold of him and cry out, help us, calls us into an authentic community. An authentic community that's not measured by, by, by did you finally get the triple? Did, can, have you stood out enough? But an authentic community that says simply to come and be in the presence, to be close to Jesus. He's first and he's enough. But the call and the challenge of life is to stay close. And the enemy of this faith in him is to stay alone. It's not to come back. I cannot tell you how many times I have, I have somebody that will come in and talk to me about, about a, a, an issue, a challenge in their life, something big, you know, whatever it may be. And it's intriguing to me that, that when someone comes in, the honest truth is, I suspect that 80, 90, maybe 95% of those conversations are conversations where the decision is already predetermined. It's been thought through alone. It's, it's been processed alone. I've got to figure this out myself. I've got to do it myself. I've got to handle it myself. And I think of how, how sad that is for us. To have this, have this amazing opportunity as, as, as the people of God to, to, to live within a, a true, authentic community where we can seek counsel and we can offer advice. And, but this is the, this is the call. So... In Warsaw, Poland, um, three weeks ago, I guess, um, and Cheryl and I were at a theological school that had the students, by their own choice, left. The dormitories were made available for refugees, and there were, I think there was one uh, elderly man, and all the rest were young women and children. And when we got there, um, a woman named Aneta came up. I think she's like an associate dean or something of the school, this college. And she walked up to me, and the very first thing she said was, it all started with a single phone call. It all started with a single phone call. I'm like, okay, what? She says, we were open in the semester. We were moving past COVID. People were coming. They were moving into the dorms. We got a call, and someone said, can you take one refugee family? We said, yes, we have an empty room. We're happy to take them. She said, now look at what's happened. Every room, every, everything, everything's online, every classroom, every, every, every dormitory room, everything now is, is, is being utilized by all of these, by, by, by hundreds of these refugees. And she says, when, when we took the one family, we sat together as a staff, and we sat together as, as students, and together we simply said this as we prayed, Jesus is giving us a once in a lifetime opportunity. And we thought we were doing something good. But now these months later, we realize that that's not at all what Jesus had in mind for us. Instead, what Jesus had in mind for us was simply to say, if I come close to you, will you decide to stay close to me? Jesus came close in that first phone call, and he came close in every contact since then. And every time, we were given this amazing privilege to decide to follow him, to decide to stay close to him. And as she's talking, just talking matter-of-factly, I swear as if I could see Jesus just running down her chin and onto her blouse. This is the power of our faith. Not a faith in something big and bold like a building or a tradition, but our faith in a relationship and a trust, a trust enough to come and to be at the feet of Jesus himself. This is what Luke wants to say. So then, yesterday, I watched the network news. I haven't done that in a long, long time. And there was a, a woman who said something, and I agree with everything she said, but it has haunted me since. It woke me up three times last night for hours. She was at a, a protest, I guess, a demonstration, I don't know, um, in Highland Park outside of Chicago where there were these this horrific shooting and murders on parade, 4th of July. 
And she simply said this. I believe what she said. I agree with what she said. She said, prayers and thoughts are nice, but we need change. Absolutely agree. I agree that, that, there, that there needs to be conversation, legislation, whatever it may be. There needs to be something. We need to be, as people, we need to be as citizens. We need to be, we need to be aggressive and tackling. We need, to, we need to be... I get that. But I wonder if you and I have accepted not just what someone says as a protest, but if you and I have accepted that truth that prayers are nice. We do them because it's the time for prayer in the worship service. We do them because we were taught to pray at a meal. I wonder if we, if we have, without knowing it, we have accepted the pseudo-Jesus, the nice prayers. I wonder what it would be if we, as the people of God, believed that prayer is the first and the last of meaningful change in this world and in our lives. I wonder if we believe that all we are called to do is to come to the feet of Jesus, whether we are in the storm and in great danger, not thinking we are in great danger, but actually in it. I wonder if we have given that up to the 365 day sort of pseudo half taste of who Jesus is. I wonder what it would mean for us, as we offer prayers for Ukraine, prayers for peace, if we did it at the feet of Jesus. Or if we offered our prayers of gratitude for our soup kitchen and on Saturdays and the teams that serve our guests at the feet of Jesus. If we celebrated this rose in the lectern for Graham Bynum, Lauren Bennett Bynum's son, at the feet of Jesus. I wonder if, if the prayers that we offer for Martha White and for Chris McKinnon Hing and for Todd Yappel who are hospitalized at the feet of Jesus. Or the prayers that we would offer for, for David and Nikki Robinson as David's mom Jerry died last week. If we offered them truly at the feet of Jesus. I wonder if we prayed in such a way that life was shaped by what we believed those prayers could accomplish where they could come true and we trusted and believed that they could at the feet of Jesus. I think this is the challenge for us because the truth is, is, that, is that Luke is saying, are you ready to get close? And I will promise you that within this week, you will get a phone call, a first phone call, just like this school in Warsaw. It may be an actual phone call. It may be a dream that wakes you up. It may be a memory of a broken relationship. It may be, may be something that, that, that you see that you just cannot remove from your mind. All of those things can be the movement of Christ in your life. I truly believe that they come and they come and they come. And the real question is, are we ready are we ready to get close enough to Jesus at his feet so that we can bring them? Our police officer, Dion Nichol, Dion's part of our family. If you've been around, you know Dion. He's been with us for years. He's just here to help provide support for us on Sunday mornings. Dion came in late this morning because he was on duty on a call with an untimely death. A death that leaves a 12-year-old without a mom. A death that did not have to happen. And that's what Dion does day after day after day after day. He's not famous in our community. He's not noted to be the chief. But Dion hits singles every day just in his faithfulness. Faithfulness to our city, but even more faithfulness to his God, who gives him strength. I think this is the answer for the world, my friends. To bring our prayers, not the nice ones, but the shouts, the raves, the calls, the, the 
prayers of true faith to Jesus at his feet and to die to ourselves and say, you know, if you hit a single and a single and a single and a single and a single, you will always win the World Series. Let's let the great names live in another realm. Let's be faithful at his feet. Amen? Amen. Friends, as we respond to God's words to us today, we have the opportunity to, to give up our tithes and additional offerings. I encourage you to find the basket on the floor near the center aisle and place your connection card in there as well as your tithes and offerings. Um, pass the basket down your pew and our greeters will come and pick up the basket on the outside aisle. If you're watching online, you can also participate in our offering by finding um, the button above the live feed that says gifts. Um, go on that and it will walk you through the giving process or you can use text to give and that number is 757-530-5683. Type in the word give, the amount you want to give, send the text and it will walk you through the giving process. So as we reflect, as we respond on God's word for us today, let us continue to worship. Thank you.
Jesus, we are overwhelmed by your love and grace. And Holy Spirit, continue to lead us and guide us. Lord, take these gifts and use them. Take us and use us. For your glory alone. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Christian, in whom do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of your last. Amen. Please be seated. Please join me in prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you. We thank you for the gift of this day, for the opportunity, Lord, to lay at your feet our lives, those that we love, those that we care for, those that we're worried about. We also thank you for the opportunity to bring you the world, to lay it at your feet. Ukraine, our country, Sudan, Ethiopia, so many other places that need your light and love and discernment. We thank you, Lord, that that prayer changes the world. And we pray, Lord, that you would find us faithful in putting our faith in you alone. Hear us as we call on your name, praying together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
you're worshiping with us for the first time, we've got a little gift for you. It's a book by Rick Warren called What on Earth Am I Here For? It's really a great read. Uh, you can get it in the narthex at a table. If you want to go this way and have coffee and donuts, there's another table in the common area. We just want to let you have it. You don't have to sign anything or shake a hand. If you want to hold up something in prayer, whatever it is, come on up to the communion table at the end of the service. And our, our uh, prayer team that's been in our sanctuary praying for us throughout the service will be there. It'll be a gift and a privilege for them and for you. And I want to encourage you, come back tonight. Meals at 515, it's free, it's great food. Uh, the class starts for adults, and for the programming for our kids, it's right around 6. Uh, but just come. It is just a great opportunity to be together, to grow in our faith uh, for all ages. I mean, it is just absolutely the highlight, highlight, highlight of a year for us. So beautiful things happening. If we call ourselves to fall at the feet of Jesus, to stay close, what's that mean? means that we bring our prayers and we pray boldly and faithfully. It means something else, though. It means that every conversation that we have this week is a conversation that we begin knowing that Jesus is seated or standing next to us. Every interaction that we have, every hard thing, every good thing, every challenge, every joy, is that we are at his feet and he is with us. I believe that if we do that, even in a week, things change in powerful, beautiful, eternal ways. Let us be the people of God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.